Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today on HIV and weight gain. Here are my disclosures. So obesity is defined as a body mass index of greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared, and it affects about 13% of the world. Uh, and that 13% figure is nearly three times greater than it was in 1975. It affects uh, seven countries, I should say, have uh, their more than 30% of its adult population being obese, with the United States at 36%. Australia and Europe is generally 20 to 30%. And many Asian countries, of course, such as China, India, and Japan have far lower rates, all less than 10%. Within the HIV population, there's not a lot of data. There's four studies, three of which are quite small, and the prevalence ranges between 15 and 39%. In the general population, the complications of being overweight or obese are many. It causes hypertension and type 2 diabetes, and both of those will lead to cardiovascular disease. Diabetes also causes kidney disease, retinal disease and peripheral neuropathy, and there are other complications, including osteoarthritis, many forms of cancer, obstructive sleep apnea, and fatty liver disease. Collectively, overweight and obesity cause 4 million deaths a year, of which about 70% are from cardiovascular disease. Importantly, 85% of these deaths occur in low to middle income countries, so this is not a problem just of the developed world. If your body mass index increases by five kilograms per metre squared, that will increase your risk of death by about 30%, which is shown in the figure on the right of the screen. And that risk is about 30% regardless of whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're young or old, or where you live in the world. And I don't see any reason why it should be particularly different for an adult with HIV whose virus is well controlled. Gilead has combined its data from eight randomized trials of initial antiretroviral therapy. And in the 16 groups shown there, you can see that the weight gain over 48 weeks was anywhere from 0.3 to 3.5 kilograms. But of course, the regimens were very different between these studies and the patient population was different. So they looked to see whether there were particular risk factors for weight gain, and there were, quite, there were both patient risk factors and antiretroviral risk factors. The patient risk factors was, were a CD4 count less than 200, a viral load above 100,000, being overweight or obese at baseline with a BMI above 25, being a woman, and being of black race. In terms of antiretroviral therapy, Bictegravir and Dolutegravir cause more weight gain than efavirenz, but importantly, uh, real pivirine also showed more weight gain than efavirenz. TAF showed more weight gain than both the Bacavir and TDF. Now, because this is a, a, a consolidation of eight randomized trials, it doesn't tell you perhaps all the information that you might get if, if all these trials were analyzed individually. Just a few more uh, trials that I think make a few observations. Firstly, on the left is the SPRING-1 trial, which was the phase two comparison of dolutegravir and efavirenz. And here you see that with three different doses of dolutegravir, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, and 50 milligrams, that there was a stepwise increase in body weight at week 96. So the people who got the highest dose of dolutegravir got the greatest amount of weight gain. On the right is the comparison of raltegravir and TDF-FTC in the NEAT001 trial, where both uh, were combined with boosted darunavir. And again, the weight gain was greater in those who received raltegravir than TDF-FTC. But the study that brought this issue to the front of our minds more than any other was probably the advanced trial. And for me, there are seven key findings from this study, six of which are shown on this slide. Firstly, over three years, the weight goes up, and there is no evidence that after three years that the weight has stabilised, the weight is continuing to increase. Secondly, there is more weight gain with TAF FTC dolutegravir shown in the red than with TDF FTC dolutegravir in blue, and there's the least amount of weight gain with TDF FTC efavirenz. Now that doesn't tell you that one regimen is causing weight gain or is causing weight loss. You need additional control groups for that sort of certainty, but it certainly confirms that there's a difference uh, between 
TAF and TDF and between efavirenz and dolutegravir. Thirdly, there's much more weight gain in the women than in the men. Uh, four and five uh, observations based on the body composition data. So the changes in weight in, but in muscle mass and fat mass. And the boxes in yellow, in orange and green show that uh, most of the weight gain was gain in fat, not in muscle. And importantly in green, uh, what you see is the increase in limb fat. So that's telling you that this is not lipodystrophy where there is fat loss, but rather you have a generalized fat gain. On the bottom right, point six is looks at the changes in weight with efavirenz versus the metabolism of efavirenz. So people who had slow metabolism of efavirenz and therefore would have had the highest concentrations of the efavirenz in their bloodstream, are gained the least amount of weight. And the people who are more rapid metabolizers of efavirenz had the greatest weight gain. And that's a finding that has now been demonstrated in two other cohorts. So I think is a very real finding. Lastly, number seven is an observation that I think the investigators didn't really observe. And that's the comparison of the changes in the study in the advanced trial versus what is known of the South African general population. So on the left are men, on the right are women. The white bars are the baseline values and the bars in orange, green and pink show the values at week 96 for the three different regimens. The bars in yellow show two general population cohorts from South Africa. And what I think both the, is you're seeing in both the men and the women is that the weight gain is basically at week 96 approaching the weight seen in healthy adults within South Africa. And the reason women may gain a lot more than when, men is because women in South Africa have a much higher body mass index than men in South Africa. Importantly, uh, you'll notice that in the women, uh, in the pink bar, the dolutegravir F-TAF group, they do, there's a suggestion that they are going overshooting the, uh, the healthy control values. So Matt, that is probably the only evidence that I'm aware of that suggests that these regimens are actually causing weight gain uh, and that some of the other regimens are uh, causing a suppression of weight gain. These data were shown at Croy, and these are data from pregnant women who received the same regimens as the in the advanced trial. And what is shown here is the weight gain per week in women who were pregnant. And the weight gain was greatest in the dolutegravir FTAF group, just like in the advanced trial. But in the bottom uh, line is shown the recommended weight gain based on healthy pregnancy outcomes in the general population. And you can see that the dolutegravir FTAF group with 0.38 kilograms per week is very similar to what is recommended, whereas the tenofovir-based regimens have less weight gain. So again, this is suggesting that TDF and efavirenz suppress weight gain um, and that dolutegravir and TAF do not cause weight gain. Importantly, uh, those who gained less weight had more adverse pregnancy outcomes and their babies were, had, were smaller for gestational age. Uh, obviously, two very adverse outcomes. This slide, I think, makes a very important point, and it uh, comes from the Duravarine trials, but I don't think the trials matter that much. What is shown in the two red circles are the week 96 changes within these studies. And it's a comparison of the mean and the median. And you can see that the mean increases are far greater than the medians, which suggests that if means are greater than medians, there must be people who have much higher changes. So these people are not having two kilograms of weight gain, but they're probably having 10 or 15 kilograms of weight gain, which drives the median, the mean values up. Uh, and none of the trials have really given us any indication of who these patients are. Who are the patients who gain the most weight? And for me, that's probably a very a critical uh, piece of information yet to be learned. So here is a study that attempts to pull together the results uh, showing the changes in the naive trials in the top half of the slide, then the switch studies in the middle, 
and the PrEP trials at the bottom. The numbers are the mean changes in weight, mostly at week 96. The pink boxes show study groups where the changes were less with TDF or less with the favarins than their comparator. The yellow is where integrase gave you more weight gain than its comparator. And the blue is where TAF is greater than its comparator. And you will also notice as I've tried to suggest through the talk so far, that the naive trials experienced far greater weight gain than in the switch or the PrEP trials. So what does this all mean? So if we take the average Australian man who weighs about 86 kilograms and he starts a regimen with TAF or Integrase or in fact any medicine, if he gains two kilograms, his BMI doesn't change very much. If he gains 10 kilograms, his BMI goes to 31, which makes him obese. To increase his BMI by five kilograms per meter squared, which gives you that 30% increased risk of death, he needs to gain 15 kilograms. So it's a lot of weight. But please remember that 40% of weight-related deaths occur in adults who are not obese. And of course, morbidity can come from smaller BMI increments um, in addition to any mortality risk. The advanced trial has taken its body weight and metabolic and blood pressure changes and modeled those in terms of cardiovascular and diabetic risk over 10 years. And basically they showed that the cardiovascular risk increase was quite small and quite, and the differences between the three regimens were really quite small as well. And that the risk with diabetes was a little bit higher, but still quite small. Importantly, however, these are young adults and they've only been followed for two years. So we shouldn't extrapolate this to older populations and we need to see longer term data. So what are the possible mechanisms? Um, really, I'm going to only show this slide because the data we have is very, very limited and I don't think it's of very good quality. Is it increased calorie intake because of increased appetite? Is it reduced physical activity? Or in fact, is intake and activity unchanged, but patients become better at storing lipid, possibly because of altered adipokine production or uh, autonomic activity. In short, we don't know. But let's think about how somebody might gain weight or lose weight uh, in a more general uh, in, uh, circumstance. So the average Australian consumes 450 grams of food a day, and that's shown in the yellow box at the bottom left. Uh, combined with oxygen in white, that will be metabolized to carbon dioxide in red and uh, water in blue. And uh, that allows for stability of weight at any given level of activity. If that, that person then consumes an extra 300 grams of food a day, so the yellow box is now bigger, and their physical activity is constant, then the red and blue boxes stay the same, and they've now got a pink box which is fat storage. And the figure on the right-hand side of your screen is just a reminder to all of us that whether we consume excess calories as proteins, as carbohydrates, or as lipids, the body has very efficient processes for converting those three uh, chemical classes uh, into lipid storage uh, if it's not being metabolized for energy. So, what can we tell our patients? Well, it's very easy to tell patients to restrict their uh, calorie intake and to increase their physical activity. And I'm sure we've all experienced that that can be a very difficult um, thing for patients to achieve. So uh, encouraging uh, patients to meet with a dietitian to review their diet, I often find to be quite productive. In terms of Switching antiviral therapy, unfortunately, we have no randomized trial of either switching an integrase or switching TAF that definitively show weight loss. There are some medications that could be theoretically used, maybe medications like metformin, but we don't have any data. And we only have a few case reports about bariatric surgery, and we don't know what such surgery can do to the levels of antiretroviral drugs. But in short, if we want to lose fat, the figure on the, on the right-hand side tells us how. The metabolism of fat is a, is a chemical equation. If you 
add oxygen and you will convert that to carbon dioxide and water. So what patients need to do is generate more carbon dioxide. And the way they do that is exercise that makes them uh, breathe out more carbon dioxide. So it's more physical activity with a stable fat mass. And of course, it's less fat production by less intake. So I think the HIV lipodystrophy story is a very useful lesson for telling us what we may know now and what we still don't know. So between 1996 and 2008 on the left-hand side of your screen is the sort of some of the major milestones uh, where we went from thinking therapy was excellent and safe to the first reported features of lipodystrophy. It was at least another five years till we, till we were able to confirm that it was that the thymidine nucleosides were heavily involved and another six years before we learned conclusively that the protease inhibitors did not cause lipodystrophy at all. On the right hand side are some of the milestones in the weight gain story where we go from 2014 where it was on no one's uh, radar to a few case reports to the larger cohorts and then to the limited randomized trial data. Uh, and I think now where we are is the sort of general notions that TAF and dolutegravir cause fat gain and TDF and efavirenz prevent it. I'm not sure that I completely agree with both of those statements, but I think that's probably where we are today. And in pink are some of the key questions that I think remain to be answered. Can three drug classes really cause, or really all affect weight, body weight? What are the mechanisms? What's the biology? Um, that makes some people at higher risk than others? Uh, is there a hierarchy in drug classes? In other words, do some drugs within a drug class cause this problem and other drugs don't? Does the weight stabilize after two years? Is it reversible? Is it treatable? And of course, what are the clinical consequences? So uh, there's only one uh, guideline body uh, that's giving us some indications about how we might deal with this, which is from the European AIDS Clinical Society, uh, that recommend uh, that we measure weight, body mass index, and waist circumference. I'm not, I don't measure waist circumference uh, because I think it's technically quite difficult to do well. Uh, we both agree uh, about measuring lipids, about measuring glucose, and estimating cardiovascular risk. Uh, and the Europeans suggest, and I think it's not a bad idea, to also think about fatty liver disease. So NAFLD is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I also measure hemoglobin A1C because I think it's a great way of easily screening for you know, th uh, longer term changes in blood glucose. In terms of intervention, um, I think Dietary restriction and increased exercise are easy to recommend, although not generally successful. That the Europeans don't recommend switching because they say there's no data. Uh, as a clinician who treats patients who are often very concerned about their weight gain, if there's no effect of diet and exercise, I would consider switching if their cardiovascular risk was high, if they had become diabetic or had worsening diabetes or if there was a major cosmetic concern. As for weight loss drugs, the Europeans mention them, but don't recommend them. I have referred some patients to an endocrinologist for an opinion, and some people have started these, but that's fairly rare. And likewise, bariatric surgery can be considered uh, for people who, with a very high body mass index. For contrast, the, uh, the US DHHS guidelines mentioned that weight gain is an issue, but its management is not discussed at all. So in summary, I think weight gain in HIV positive adults who start therapy is generally not severe after two years, but there are clearly outliers and subgroups. It is likely to cause more non-communicable disease and deaths, even in those who don't become obese. It's greater after treatment initiation than with switching or with PrEP probably because of the return to health phenomenon. And I think the South African experience gives us an idea of what uh, returning to normal within that society. So if you are in a society where weight gain is 
acceptable or even desirable, then perhaps it's going to be more likely. In terms of medications, I think there's good evidence that TDF and efavirenz inhibit weight gain, but the evidence that integrase inhibitors and TAF cause weight gain is a little less clear. There's no clear evidence of, the, of an overshoot in weight gain, and most of the studies have significant limitations. And lastly, you know, somebody asked me this question, and I think it's a, quite a reasonable question. How can a medication like tenofovir cause weight loss at one concentration and weight gain at a different concentration? Um, some rare drugs can do uh, have opposing effects at different concentrations, but that's a fairly uncommon phenomenon. So with that, I thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions.